Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the Asheville Museum of Science Ask a Scientist series. My name is Abby, and I am one of the educators with the museum, and today we are talking with Dr. Christina Pistone, who is an atmospheric and climate scientist with the NASA Ames Research Center near San Jose, California. So a large part of her research focuses on pollution and how it can affect our broader climate and clouds. And to do this, she gets to fly in fancy planes and use fancy computer technology and instruments to measure, um, to take a lot of measurements and tell us kind of about how, how all those things are affected. So she specifically looks at clouds off the coast of Africa. Sometimes her words, she dabbles in the Arctic. So um, we are very excited to, to have her and let's all give her a welcome and send in our questions. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Good to be here. Um, yeah, should I just start talking? Take it to away. The slides that I have? Heck or? Yeah. Okay. Introduce yourself. Take it away. Yeah, so I put together some slides because everybody likes to look at pictures, right? So um, give me one second to share my screen. And I hope you are seeing the shared, the proper shared screen right now. Looking good. Cool. Yeah, so uh, hi, everybody. My name is Christina Pistone. I'm a research scientist. I work at NASA Ames for the Bay Area Environmental Research Institute. So today I was just going to talk a little bit about the work I do and how I got to my job and then um, hopefully take any questions that you have, um, any questions about anything throughout, just drop them in the chat and uh, hopefully I'll be able to see them. So um, the general topic that I want to talk about today is uh, what I do is observing atmospheric particles um, and what effect they have on the climate. And basically what we're doing is asking the question, how do aerosols affect clouds and why do we care? And aerosols is like the science term in there, and we're going to talk about what exactly that means uh, in a little bit. But I just wanted to share this photo, which is one that we took during some field work in the Maldives. And you see that the sun is in the middle there. Um, so this was during sunset. And because there was so much aerosol in the atmosphere, the sun was setting. The sun would set before it actually got to the horizon, before it got to the ocean. So you can see it's it's basically like only a half sun um, just because of all of the aerosol in the atmosphere. So we had like sun tracking instruments and we would know that the sun had actually set when they reset for sunrise. Um, so that was fun and also a little uh, like, wow, there's so much stuff here. So I wanted to talk a little bit since I think this is like a high school or middle school or everyone, kid, mm -hmm. uh, everybody audience. Um, just like how I ended up in science. So I grew up in Southern California uh, and then I ended up going to college slightly south of there in San Diego. Uh, and then I ended up spending some time in Santiago de Chile and Washington DC. And then I wanted to come back to California because that's sort of home. Um, and so now I live up in the Bay Area, which uh, California is a deceptively large state, but, you know, we're working on it. And everybody likes to know about our pets, right? So um, these are these are my cats who may or may not make an appearance. They're actually sleeping on the chair behind me right now. Um, so they may they may or may not make an appearance. Uh, the, the one who's outside was uh, supervised. He, he was always supervised when we went outside and we lost him to kidney failure, not to bring things down, but I like to keep him as an homage in my slides because he was the best kitty cat and was so happy to be outside. Supervised, always supervised. Um, I have some bonus pets, which fight climate change. These are my composting worms. Been getting probably overfed during pandemic times when we're always at home and always cooking at home. So uh, yeah, I went to college at UC San Diego, um, I majored in physics and then I ended up second majoring in Spanish literature, which, um, be because it was fun basically. Uh, so yeah, so I went to college for physics and really I, I went to college 
I, I went, I majored in physics because it was something that was interesting to me from high school. I had a really good physics teacher and was like, yeah, this is something that I think is interesting. Well, sure, let's do it. Um, so that's kind of how that started. And then going through college, I sort of, I got an experience of uh, research as an undergrad over a summer. And that was sort of my first experience of, I could do this as a job. That's pretty cool. People will pay me. They won't pay me a whole lot, but they'll pay me to do this, which was nice. Um, and then I ended up taking a class in my last year, second to last year of undergrad on the physical climate system, which is basically just taking physics and applying it to the earth system. So a lot of the world is applied physics. Um, and this was something that was really interesting to me and it really, um, it, it was a topic that was really compelling to me. So I ended up uh, staying in San Diego to do my PhD at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, which is technically also part of UCSD. Um, and so I was studying climate science there, specifically the atmosphere. And so here are some photos from uh, the field work that was part of my PhD. We had tiny unmanned vehicles that we flew around. Um, that was our photo op on one of the last days. And there's some of the other crew who were at the observatory on the northern Indian Ocean where we were making our measurements. So skipping ahead to where I am now, um, I started at Ames as a postdoc, which is basically a research position um, that comes after your doctorate, after you finish grad school. Um, so I've, I started here about five years ago. Actually, um, and postdocs are usually shorter term positions. Um, so when that ended, I transitioned to being a research scientist. So um, I work with the instruments and I work with the data that we collected that I'll talk about um, in Africa. And here are some cool action shots of various places in the before times because we don't really go out anymore because, uh, you know, so the science term that I'm going to introduce today uh, is aerosol. And a lot of people, when they hear the word aerosol, they're thinking of like hairspray cans, like stuff that's hairspray cans. Um, but really the, the scientific definition that we use for aerosol is just any solid, or solid particle or liquid droplet, which is suspended in a gas. Um, and when we're talking about it in terms of climate, there are lots of different atmospheric aerosols that we can observe that, that are being emitted into the atmosphere. Um, and they're very important, particularly in the formation of clouds. And I'll talk about, they, they help clouds form basically. Um, from sort of a health perspective, we are interested in them because uh, usually the types that the humans are creating are not good for, not good to breathe. Uh, they can create smog, they can create uh, respiratory and cardiac just, uh, asthma. So we don't really want a lot of those, especially down where people are um, breathing the air. And then from a climate perspective, overall they mostly have a cooling effect, but then some of them don't. Uh, so this photo here is a satellite image from NASA of the Indian uh, subcontinents. And you can see that uh, the Himalayas are the mountains up at the top there. And all of this haze is just um, aerosols that you can see from space. Because when you have a lot of them, it's pretty easy to see. So this was uh, near where I did my PhD work. And so some sources of aerosol I sort of mentioned some of them are natural, like we, we do have natural aerosols and again, they're important for making clouds and stuff. Um, so when you have a breaking wave, it'll put little particles into the atmosphere. Um, wind over the desert, you have desert dust that gets lofted into the atmosphere. Trees emit certain components that turn into aerosol particles, volcanoes also. Um, and then there's also anthropogenic sources. So power plant emissions, uh, diesel engines put a lot of particles. Um, anytime there's burning going on, 
uh, either widespread like outdoors for agricultural purposes or indoors, which happens a lot in Asia um, for fuel and cooking and stuff and heating. Those are all creating particles. Um, so, so there's a lot of different sources. And then wildfires is a little bit of an interesting one because uh, they can't be natural, but also they can be um, exacerbated by human causes like climate change that we're seeing now. So um, it's a little bit interesting. It's, it's a little bit natural and also it's sort of escalating because of anthropogenic human cause, human cause, human causes. There we go. And I just wanted to show another couple pictures. Um, so the top one, I should actually update this because we have similar photos now from this year where we live now. Um, but the top one is my dorm from UCSD when there were wildfires in 2003. And you can see the sky was just orange. You can, can't really see the sun at all. Um, and then the bottom one is that same photo that I showed at the beginning where there's just a lot of aerosol in the atmosphere blocking off the disk of the sun so you can't really see it. Um, but again, the interesting thing about aerosols is that these effects are temporary. If we're comparing it to something like carbon dioxide when we're uh, running our cars and, and burning fossil fuels. Um, those effects last for a very long time. Um, but when we're talking about aerosols, the effects are very temporary and you can see it really dramatically like before or after a rain. Uh, so the top photo is from a tall mountain, tallish mountain uh, in the city of Santiago uh, called San Cristobal. And it was really cool to go and see um, on like a normal day, which is the top. And then right after it had just rained um, and you can see that there are mountains behind that little hill there. Um, so it's really quite dramatic, the differences that you can see in aerosols, um, just because the rain will pull things out. Uh, so aerosols usually last in the atmosphere for like a few days to a week compared to carbon dioxide, which might be like centuries. Um, this is like a good pause point if anybody has any questions and I'm going to take a drink of water. Yeah, so um, how much can aerosols, can they degrade over time? Like, do they become less dangerous over time or are they just always dangerous? So it, it, it depends on the type. Um, a lot of people are working on like the interesting questions of how do aerosols age? Because that's definitely a thing. So. I don't do it, but you have like secondary aerosol formation, which is you're emitting um, components from cars. They interact with sunlight and they make particles. So they emit gases and it turns into particles. And there's a really cool um, demo that you can do where you put like um, you, you create UV or you create ozone with a UV pen and then you put an orange peel in and orange like VOCs. And so you shake it up and then you'll see the particles form. You can like shine a laser pointer through and you can see that there's stuff there that wasn't there before. Um, so you can have changes definitely over time. In terms of the particles that are emitted, there's a lot of questions like, how do they age? Um, so the properties can be changing. We're more interested in like from a climate perspective, um, like how they, how they interact with sunlight differently. Um, when they're older particles versus younger particles. Uh, so there definitely are changes in terms of, I think your question was, do they become less dangerous for people? Uh, it's probably about the same. Um, you really just kind of hope that it either, in the case of the Bay Area, when we had all these massive fires, you kind of hope it goes out to sea or that you get some rain and it'll remove it through those processes. And are are some clouds better at, I guess, holding pollution or these aerosols than other types of clouds? Well, so the clouds really are, the clouds form in the environments that they have. So the clouds, 
Well, I'll, I'll talk about it in a little bit, I think. I okay. think I have a slide there later. Um, but it definitely changes the properties of the cloud. It changes what the clouds look like depending on how much aerosol you have. Um, so these are things that are really interesting questions that we don't totally know exactly what happens because you have, you, especially in the case of these like absorbing particles, ones that absorb sunlight like soot, you end up having competing effects where some can make the clouds less bright and some can make the clouds more bright. So it's, it's a really interesting question. And I'm sure this research is really useful for all clouds everywhere, but is there a reason that you and your group specifically look at the clouds off of Africa, the African coast? Does that have, um, is there something unique about those clouds? Yes, there is. Oh boy. And I think I, I think I also have slides on this later. Basically it's, um, we wanted to go to a place where we knew we'd have clouds and we knew we'd have fires. So the, seasonal signal in these biomass burning aerosols so aerosols from fires is really reproducible so it happens like every year around september so um instead of being in california and hoping but really not hoping that there would be fires which we could measure in order to measure these characteristics, um, we go to a place where we know there's going to be a lot of, um, and also it's, it is similar to California in that just off the coast of Africa, you have this persistent stratocumulus deck. So it's a, a large rain, a large area that's covered by clouds, which are fairly uniform in their properties. And so if we're trying to, uh, disentangle all these different effects that are happening, it's a good place to go just because the clouds are fairly uniform to begin with. And we know we're going to, so we know we're going to find clouds and we know we're going to find aerosols. And um, it's, a, it's a good sort of test bed in order to better understand these things, which um, may manifest themselves differently globally. We'll save the other questions for, for after, because I think that you're going to come to answer some of them. <laughs> okay, I'll go on a little bit more. Um, so here's just a slide that I put together, I think it was in like May, um, showing differences that we saw, especially in some locations, um, based on the response to COVID. So here are some internet photos from, of LA and New Delhi from last, last year, I guess two years ago now. Um, and then two photos in April of 2020. Um, so a lot of places saw sort of really dramatic decreases in their aerosol population um, compared to what they might normally see. Um, the more, it, it's actually interesting, there was a large conference in last month in December where a, a lot of people are talking about this. And it seems a little more complicated than just um, aerosols always went down. So it, it depends It depends on the sources, right? It depends on what industries were subject to the shutdown because some things were still going on. Um, but it is still a really interesting uh, question to see like how the local skies changed based on um, us hopefully shutting everything down uh, to try to deal with this virus. And then I just wanted to show this slide because it's really cool. Um, it, a lot of people, if, if you follow the right people on Twitter and uh, in the media, a lot of people are talking about uh, aerosols are also why it's really important that you wear your mask uh, when you go outside. Um, so here's an illustration that I, kind of just love. So imagine these little red dots are all aerosols. Um, if a person is infected, that person is going to be putting out a whole bunch of little particles. So that's why you probably want to not be so close to them because it's really concentrated where it's coming out of their mouth. Um, but even if you're far away, you still might have a whole lot of them. Uh, they can fall to the ground and they can sort of be like kicked up if somebody walks past, if you don't have enough cleaning. Um, so we don't want that, but you can do these interventions um, and wearing a mask and ventilation. So changing the air 
with other air that has less virus load, less of these little aerosol particles that we just make normally while we're talking or singing or talking at loud volume. Um, so, so it's a lot of people have been um, talking about why that's important as well. And it's specifically for aerosols, which is not something that I ever would have thought would be relevant to my research. Um, and Lindsay Marr made these figures and has presented them at the National Academies. And I love their tiny little masks. It's adorable. Um, yeah, so another reason why aerosols are important, wear a mask. Uh, going back to clouds. Yeah, so um, I said that, cloud, that aerosols are important to cloud formation. And this is just basically, I don't know if we know how clouds form. Um, in the simplest sort of model, you have a cloud form. Um, when you have water evaporating from the surface and that um, humid air is going to rise, as it rises, it cools. Um, and then as it cools, it condenses into cloud droplets. So as it gets too cold, uh, the, the colder air can't hold as much water. So instead of being water vapor, like steam, it turns into liquid water. But in order for this process to happen, it really helps if the water has something to condense on. So it acts like a little seed. We call them cloud condensation nuclei. Um, so that's what aerosols do. So it really, so, so when you have more aerosols in the atmosphere, it sort of makes more of these little condensation surfaces for, for the water to condense on and then we have clouds which form. Mm -hmm. And a really good example of what happens, uh, of, of how these processes happen, is this image here, which is showing ship tracks. And so you can see uh, the land up at the top right corner is the California coast. So we're continually having a whole bunch of shipping uh, traffic going from Asia to the west coast of the US. And as they go across the ocean, they are burning fuels, which are um, famously made of stuff which is not necessarily uh, not gross. So they, they burn their fuels and it puts a whole bunch of particles into the air. And you can actually see from space these um, tracks following the ships because as you put the particles into the atmosphere, the clouds which form behind them are brighter. Um, and this is because since there's more particles, you end up having more places for the water to condense, which means you have more droplets. So if it's the same amount of water and it's spread over more droplets, that makes the cloud brighter um, because the sunlight basically can scatter back more than it, than it would if the droplets were bigger. So this is an example where you can really see um, the effects of aerosols on clouds here. And I just wanted to put this up as well. Um, you don't have to read all of this stuff. The point I wanted to convey from this slide is that sometimes when aerosols interact with clouds, you have a cooling effect, which I put in blue. And sometimes with clouds, you have a warming effect, which I put in orange. And so when you might get one of these effects versus the other, they're, they're like basically 50-50, right? It depends on the type of aerosol. It depends on the type of cloud that we're dealing with. Uh, it depends on the predominant meteorology. So there's a whole bunch of different factors, and you may have more than one of these effects at a time. And so um, understanding cumulatively how all of these uh, what what the ultimate warming or cooling is going to be from these particles is something that a lot of people are working on, and it's a really, really interesting question that we're all trying to do. Should I pause, or should I just talk about the work that we're going to do? Because the no, next I was slide just about is to stop talking you. about why we went. <laughs> I was just about to stop you. So we have one question that asks, how long do aerosols typically stay in the air? It's usually about a few days to maybe like a week. Okay. It'll depend on if it rains, it'll depend on, rain is a very effective way to eliminate the particles. Can, and this, a random question, can rain 
or I guess like can the aerosols be spread different to different locations geographically because of the clouds? Yeah. That's kind of cool. And and <laughs> well, so the another interesting thing about aerosols is like when they're in the atmosphere. So carbon dioxide, when you emit it, because it lasts in the atmosphere for such a very long time, it tends to be pretty well mixed globally. Mm -hmm. But aerosols tend to stay relatively close to where they were emitted. Um, of course, you do get like desert dust from Africa making it over to Caribbean and uh, pollution from Asia making it across the Pacific to the Sierra snowpack. So like they do transport somewhat long distances, but most of the effects, especially if we're talking about like near to the surface where the people are, they tend to be where the emissions happen. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's a really interesting case because a, a lot of the resistance, I think, to action on climate change is that it's hard for people to understand something that is happening is happening now, but will happen a lot worse in the future on a long time scale. Um, but aerosols are something that you can see pretty acutely yeah. near where these emissions are happening. So, and then we also have: um, Are all aerosols harmful to human and environmental health? Um, some of them are worse than other ones. Uh, I definitely kept all of the windows closed when we had the wildfires and ran the air purifier. Um, it, it'll depend, for example, the example of the fires, it depends on what is burned, right? So none of them are really good, I don't think. Like, sea spray, sea spray is probably fine. I'm, I'm not an epidemiologist, so I don't totally know. But I do know the ones that, like, w when you're burning... When the things that are burning are like involving houses with electronics in it, which is a very awful situation, like that, that will be worse, right? Just because the things which are burning have a whole bunch of different chemical, right? Uh, and so, can anything aerosolize? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, it, it'll so so a lot of the differences in how aerosols are formed depend on the burning conditions. Okay. So you'll get you'll get di aerosols with different properties depending on whether a fire is flint smoldering. So and and you can kind of see that if you've ever like had a bonfire or a campfire if you put certain wood on it might make a black smoke or if you let it go for too long it might be like a white smoke when you put it out. I don't go I don't remember what the outside is anymore, but, but you can end up with different, with a range of different properties, right? Um, and that depends a lot on like the burning temperature. So a lot of um, what people are trying to do in terms of uh, a, a lot of places in the developing world, aerosols come from like cooking sources. And so they, they are trying to convince women that they should use special stoves and in principle those stoves will just like make the burning more efficient which is great in principle and then in practice um it gets a little dicey because you're basically just telling people to change what they've done for no reason um for reasons for reasons that they aren't describing properly right and yeah but but that's sort of the principle behind the cook stove projects which have had somewhat limited success I think it's it's a good idea in principle and I think the execution has been lacking <laughs> unfortunately should I go on did that answer the question mm -hmm. okay so I'm going to talk a little bit about the actual work that I have been working on. Um, and this is one of the questions that we had earlier, I think. Um, basically, why go to the Southeast Atlantic Ocean? Why go to the coast of Africa when we have a perfectly good coast right near us? Um, down to knowing when there will be smoke, knowing that where there will be a particular kind of smoke because we were interested in these absorbing aerosols. 
um, so the, the ones from the biomass burning fires, um, and where we will have sort of a uniform uh, amount of cloud where we can really study both the properties of the aerosols and the properties of the clouds. And you can see sort of, I don't know if you can see my map, uh, my mouse. Um, the red dots here are fire counts from MODIS, which is a satellite instrument um, for one day in September. And then just off the coast, you can see that there's like a large cloud deck that's just off the coast. And you can see a little bit, there's like this, this hazy part um, near the coast inside the red circle. There's just this is aerosol and not cloud. So there's just a whole bunch of smoke that um, is transported. So it gets lofted really high into the atmosphere. And then there's a, an atmospheric jet, which takes it and just transports it directly to the west over these clouds. And then they'll, it'll sort of subside and it'll mix into the clouds eventually. And um, it'll have climate impacts when it's on top of the clouds or, and then mixing into the clouds. Um, so it's a really interesting place to be able to look at all of the different um, the, the different effects that we might that I had on the last slide of the wall of text. Are these wildfires um, human made or are they typically natural? So they're agricultural fires. So September okay. is the spring time in the southern hemisphere. So it's like in preparation for they're they're set by humans. Okay. Yeah. So the project that I was a part of was called Oracles, um, and that somehow stands for Observation of Aerosols Above Clouds and Their Interactions, because scientists love acronyms. Uh, so it is what it is. <laughs> and we had three field deployments. The first one was out of Walvis Bay, Namibia, uh, that bottom arrow right there. And then the latter two were out of Sao Tome e Principe in August 2017 and October 2018, so a little bit north of that. Um, and the shading, the red to yellow underneath those flight paths, which are the colored lines, um, shows where we expect most of the aerosol to be during uh, September. So you can sort of see that in the first year we approached it from the south, and the second year we approached it from the north. Um, and so we had in the first year, we had two planes. We had one that flew really high uh, and then one that flew sort of between the surface and maybe like seven kilometers. And we would go um, sample at different altitudes and different locations and clouds versus aerosols versus radiation, uh, depending on what the goal for a particular flight was. And so here's an interesting example i think which really illustrates the different kinds of situations when we're talking really about aerosols and clouds um so this is from a paper that i was on by sam leblanc who was also working in this project um but this really just shows three different potential orientations that you end up with of smoke above clouds so like the first one you can see there's an aerosol layer which is like that dark layer then there's a gap where there's like no interaction between the aerosol and then the underlying clouds. Um, in the second one, uh, to the left, you see there's aerosol, then there's kind of a gap, then there's more aerosol sort of, sort of touching the clouds. And then the bottom one shows just kind of aerosol and clouds right on top of one another. Um, so this is really, it's at why NASA is interested in doing these kind of projects. Um, and it's because a lot of what NASA does is observe the Earth from space, right? And if you are looking at satellite data here, how would you really be able to tell the difference in all these different orientations? Um, so it's a, really, it's a really interesting question. We saw a lot of different um, configurations of smoke and clouds and how they were interacting over the course of our three deployments. Here is some pictures, more pictures of planes. Uh, here's me in front of the P3. That was the plane that we had at all three years. Um, and at the bottom is the ER2, which is this wonky little 
platformer spy plane thing that flies really, really high. Um, but that allows us to put uh, remote sensing instruments, so instruments which basically measure sunlight reflected, or in one case we have a LIDAR, so like a laser which makes really nice profiles of the atmospheric structure. Um, so it was flying really, really high, and we get like the full column of the atmosphere. We could get the full picture at once, which is nice. Uh, yeah, so there's me, and that's the pilot who goes in the ER2. There's only one guy who goes in the ER2, um, mm -hmm. and he needs a special suit in order to be able to do that. But we can go in the bigger plane, and it would be probably like 15 or 20. I don't completely remember exactly. It depends on how much, um, how many different instruments you have um, to go there. So there was a whole bunch of different um, instruments that we had in oracles measuring aerosols and aerosol properties, radiation, so we measure the amount of sunlight and the amount of heating, um, different cloud properties, trace gases, meteorology, we're trying to really understand the full picture there. Um, there's a whole bunch of different institutions and universities which were involved and as I said before, basically we're hoping to better understand all of these different effects um, of aerosols, uh, of these biomass burning aerosols on these clouds in this region. And I wanted to show just a few slides about the instrument that I um, sort of work with at Ames when, when I get to go into Ames, which I haven't, of course, since March. Um, but it's called Four Star. And it's this little ball right here. And here's a zoomed version of it. So um, it's a cool little guy. It has been described as a cross between Darth Vader and BB-8. <laughs> uh, and so this is the, the bottom photo shows what it looks like in its whole profile. Um, when it's actually installed in the aircraft, just the ball sits above the airplane. And basically what it does is that little rectangle window will point at the sun and it measures the amount of sunlight that comes through the atmospheric column um, to the instrument. And based on what we know about um, the altitude and the latitude and the longitude, the, the other stuff that is what the atmosphere is made of um, and how much light it actually sees and how much light we would expect at that point, um, then we can determine how much, um, how much light is being scattered at different wavelengths by different atmospheric particles. And we can also do like trace gases. So ozone, we can do water vapor. Um, we can get those retrievals as well based on what we know of where different molecules are going to be absorbing at different parts of the spectrum. So, um, one of the S's in four star is spectrometers. That just means it measures at a whole bunch of different wavelengths, um, which is a really cool feature there. And, and there's the inside of the plane. So it hooks up from the can, which kind of hangs down from the roof of the plane. And then there's a big cable, which goes to the computer display. And there's an example of what, um, what the display looks like, which is a little bit hard to see, but anyway. And here's just a photo of the team as a whole. So we have um, a whole lot of people who are making research like this possible. And it's always nice to acknowledge that um, science doesn't really happen just by one person. There's a whole bunch of people who are working on it. And in my opinion, science is better when we all like have bigger teams and more ideas and are able to to work together to get things done because I don't know how we would do this for a smaller with, with a smaller group of people right because it's a really big project that's going on um yeah well yeah I have some, oh, I was gonna say we got more. some more questions if you're up for it okay sure so we have, do aerosols from something like fire or industrial pollution stay in the lower atmosphere? Um, and then another that says, are aerosols typically detected at certain elevations? So those are kind of similar. Yeah, so they, they usually do stay pretty low. Um, it'll depend on different, it, 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 it depends. 
on the meteorology and um, but most things the the lower level of the atmosphere that we call the troposphere it will stay pretty it, it won't necessarily mix upwards if you have something like a volcanic explosion uh, then you will definitely have aerosols which make it up really high up into the atmosphere so we saw that with Pinatubo where it reduce the global temperature by a measurable amount because the aerosols made it up really high into the atmosphere and they stayed for a really long time when they were up there. Um, but most of them tend to be lower, uh, but it'll depend. So like when, when we were looking at uh, the Oracle's data, it over the continent, just because you have like really strong convection so the the atmosphere during the day because it's being heated by the sun um the the atmosphere mixes upward very uh to to a pretty high altitude so maybe like six or seven kilometers which is quite high um you can compare that to like when we were in santiago the the air in santiago in the winter is very bad and that's because um Similar to Los Angeles, it's in like a basin, so it has mountains on one side, mountains on the other side, and then two smaller mountain ranges on the other two sides. So basically everything that's emitted there just kind of gets capped because uh, the atmospheric profile is that you, you only get mixing up so far and then it gets too cold. So you have, you have a temperature inversion and things don't mix up anymore. So anything that's emitted just kind of like sits and accumulates at much lower levels, probably like a kilometer or so. So it, it, it can depend, but it, it probably won't make it up really high unless you have something like a volcano or people voluntarily putting them up into the stratosphere, which I think is a bad idea. <laughs> um, one other question I have from one of my students asks, are weather balloons just filled with regular helium? I think they are. Yeah, I think. I don't. I don't totally know off the top of my head. the The cool thing about weather balloons is so so because air it, it, air cools, it, it it will expand as it rises. The yeah, it it expands as it rises because it is because the there is less air at very high altitude, so it. The, the air which is in there takes up more space. So because it needs to do that, they're very thick balloons. So on the ground, it might be like, I don't know if you can see my hands, and maybe like that, maybe a little bit bigger. They're, they're like a big balloon, but like a normal size balloon. But because you want to get like really high up into the atmosphere before they pop and stop measuring, they have to be really thick so that they can really expand when it gets high into the atmosphere because it goes through these different um, sizes at different atmospheric pressures. Um, but I think they just use helium. They probably just use helium. <laughs> I don't know for 100%. <laughs> um, another question is, can aerosols change how the sunset looks? Definitely. Aerosols can definitely change how the sunset looks. Um, yeah, because it, it will scatter light in different ways. And I haven't talked about it too much, but that's the, the atmospheric scattering is why sunsets will look orange, right? Because it's scattering at different particles. Um, so sometimes you'll get a sunset that's really, really orange. And sometimes if the world is on fire, the sky will be orange at like 10 a.m., which was really, really weird. Um, and that that didn't happen every day. I, I should have added a photo in there, but it, it's really similar to the photo that I showed this one. Um, the sky was basically this color at throughout the whole day, but only one day. So it really depends on um, where the smoke is in the in the atmospheric profile, whether it's high or low. And I think it might depend also where the water vapor is. Um, it's really interesting. <laughs> and another, so can aerosols then also change the color of that we see in the clouds? I know that you mentioned that maybe they would come off as brighter, but would we ever see colors? 
So, yes. Um, so, so when we're talking about, yeah, this is the difference between like climate and more local things. Um, but you can definitely see different, um, colors of clouds depending on what the sky looks like. Sometimes clouds might look pinker. Sometimes clouds might look more orange. Um, and it's all just the, the, how the light is scattering. So when we're talking about climate, we're more talking about like sunlight comes in the top of the atmosphere. And then what we're really caring about is whether sunlight goes away from the atmosphere, whether it gets scattered back to space. So basically it's just down and up, but clouds are really complicated. Um, especially if you end up with smaller clouds, because depending on how the sunlight will, um, encounter the cloud, it can scatter. It might not scatter right it might scatter this way. It might scatter that way. It might go straight through, but at a lesser magnitude. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different, um, we call it knee scattering is, is the technical term for how um, sunlight scatters or how light scatters from particles that are around cloud droplet size. So like most of it will scatter in one direction, but it can also scatter in different directions. And based on how, uh, how it encounters the cloud and how it encounters the aerosol, you can end up with multiple scatterings and um, it produces different colors and stuff. I don't know if that was a good answer. <laughs> I think that works. It's complicated, basically. Yeah. There's, and it's, it's, it's how much uh, can this research tell us about climate trends in the future? Well, so if you look at the big climate reports that come out every so many years, at least for the last couple two, but probably since the beginning, honestly, um, they always say that the biggest uncertainty in our understanding of the climate system is the effect of aerosols on clouds. And it's just because we don't really know for a combination of different reasons, right? So it's because... Um, when they're emitted, they tend to stay more localized. So these tend to stay in one region of the Earth. Um, and it's because there are a bunch of different competing effects that we don't necessarily know what happens when you add them together. Um, and then you have to add different regions together to try to get like a global value. And also it's because we don't know what people are going to do, which is a little bit similar to carbon dioxide, right? Um, if we decided to, um, help everybody stop so many aerosols, uh, to clean up air quality in different parts of the world, um, then the situation might look a lot different. Um, but sort of accounting for all of those uncertainties, um, the physical uncertainty and then also the human uncertainty is why it's like, it, it's a huge, it's, it's a relatively large error bar compared to like carbon dioxide. Um, for carbon dioxide in terms of like what has happened in the past, we know that pretty well. Um, but most of the uncertainties projecting into the future have to do with how much are we going to reduce our emissions? Um, how, how much more carbon dioxide are we going to burn before we stop doing it? Um, and that's really the, the differences in what we're going to be in our potential futures. And then this is, a, I like this question. Do the clouds rotate with the earth? Clouds? Um, yes. So, yes. Clouds <laughs> do rotate with the earth. Clouds also change with, like, the winds. So, so they're rotating with the earth because we are all rotating with the earth, like all the time, right? Like I'm rotating with the earth, you're rotating with the earth. We're not flying into walls, so we're rotating with the earth. So the clouds do that and the clouds are also subjected to mostly, you know, winds and other sunlight, like they can evaporate. Um, if you've ever seen like a small cloud form over a lake, I, the first time I saw it, I was like, this is cool. I understand what's going on now. But you can sort of see um, water evaporate and then form a cloud and then it will just kind of like dissipate again. It's, it's very cool if you ever 
um, notice a very small of a lake. Just kind of watch it for a bit and see what it does. See if see if there's like wind at higher altitude that will just like make it go away, or maybe it'll just like evaporate because it gets too warm. Um, so yes, clouds do rotate with the Earth, and also they um, rotate independently based on what the atmosphere is doing. And then we can we can kind of uh, finish up with this question. What is your favorite part about working as a scientist for NASA? It's my favorite part. I probably I before pandemic. <laughs> seriously, I do like field work. I it's not for everybody, and a lot of people don't like it, but that's fine because I do like it. Um, it I I always have enjoyed going and making measurements that haven't been made before and always use more measurements just the question is then do we have the time and the money to analyze them um but going out into the field and making measurements and like collecting the data seeing how the data are being collected um and and having that frame of reference when you go back and are inevitably spending like two years working on a paper, not based on a real example, JK it is, um, <laughs> trying to like understand what exactly it means in the context because there's a whole bunch of um, different things you're trying to account for, right? Um, I, I like going into the field. I like collecting data. I like seeing things for real, um, which isn't necessarily for everybody, but also I think it's the cool part. I, I definitely <laughs> think it's You can it's also the cool be a part. scientist and just sit at your computer all day. That's true. That, a lot of people do that. A lot of people do models. Can so confirm. basically you have an Earth <laughs> computer and then you look at it a bunch and then you change things and see what happens. Do you have any last oh. thoughts to leave us with today? Um. I think we covered everything. <laughs>